So the name of this talk, as you know, you're here, so you came to the talk. Tsunami. <laughs> How to survive your personal tsunami. And um, it's the first time for me to give this talk. And are you here for the tsunami talk? How to survive your personal tsunami? I'm just looking around. Uh -huh. Well, come join us. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a really fabulous talk. Yes, it is. Just getting started. Right. So, uh, no, that's, that's fine. And if, uh, we, we set up over here because I knew it would be a small group. And so I set things up over here, but then I said, okay, if more people come, we're going to have to move over there. Which this will be kind of a talk. It's going to be an active, it would be an active talk. We would be able to do things as well. So, uh, I was just mentioning the name of the talk is How to Survive Your Personal Tsunami. And the talk comes from uh, a book that I wrote entitled Tsunami Effect. And the reason I wrote this book uh, first is because uh, after the Asian tsunami that happened in 2004, I did a relief project in South India and uh, worked in several fishing villages along the coast that had been affected by the tsunami. Uh, while I was there, I witnessed such remarkable uh, capability for recovery and resilience. You know, resilience is the word now. And I really observed that. And the true splendor of working with this population, these, these people were, um, they no longer have the caste system in India, but they were from the population, these are called the fisher populations, that are not regarded very highly. And we were able to go into the villages, into their homes, work very closely with them to help them to recover from their trauma. And it was such a magnificent experience that the whole time I was even there uh, having that experience, I was thinking, Timothy, you have to write this down. And, um, and the liaison, the Modron, who, who set the project up there, um, I knew that the second day I was there, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I needed to write a story about this fellow. I was so moved by him. Um, as time went by, and I came back to the States, uh, I started writing the book about two months after I returned to the States. It took me seven years to complete the first draft because of all the things that were going on in my life, including during that time uh, going down to New Orleans and helping with recovery after uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, going through training in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. I did a lot of different things, but during that time, we also experienced the financial crisis of 2008. And during that period, I kept hearing in the news this is like a tsunami of debt. This is like a tsunami of foreclosures. And I started realizing that that word had become the word that people could use to really give the impression of what was the overwhelming destructive force that was in their life. In fact, just recently, uh, I was visiting with a very close personal friend and the, something came up about my book. Of course, I'm always talking about my book. But, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, amazing. thank you. Uh, but she said, she looked at me and she says, you know, I, I really do feel like uh, we've been going through a, a personal tsunami. And I felt, yes, that's, that's why. And that's why I've, I titled this Tsunami Effect because I want that term to be approached more in the way that we speak about what we now re regard as post-traumatic stress, my experience has been that the event is over, but the trauma is not. So it really, post-traumatic stress doesn't altogether, and I know people have been working for centuries to properly label that condition when a person has been overwhelmed and drawn out of their, their normal life. And so I refer to it as the tsunami effect. Now the interesting thing about writing this book because it became my <laughs> must do thing. While I was doing all of these other things, every day I was like, Timothy, you've got to get to your desk. You know, and they would, it would be 10.30, 11 o'clock at night and I'm getting to my desk and I'm staring at the computer saying, <laughs> I want to go to bed, you know. Oh, this is not the time I want to be trying to be creative. So eventually, I had to actually 
pay myself to write the book because I <laughs> took one day off and didn't see clients and just sat at my desk and, and wrote. And that's how I eventually got it done. It became a, an immense task. And, and over the course of writing it, then uh, I was experiencing, like I said, these events that were happening in the society with the financial collapse and other things that came along with it. One of the really curious things about the book, and I don't know if you've, any of you have written or do any creative work, music. You know, we write or we make a song or whatever, or painting, and we know what we're doing while we're doing it. And in particular, I knew immediately the title of this book would be Tsunami Effect. I knew over time how I would close the story. Um, but oddly enough, after I had written it, when I was going back and doing the editing, I started seeing things. It was like a, a, a flash surprise to me. Like, wow, I didn't even realize the story that I was telling when I was telling it. And there's one particular story in this book that as I was doing it as a public reading, I realized, oh my, this is exactly the template. This little story in this chapter is how to survive your personal tsunami. And I decided then that I wanted to give a talk and read this excerpt and go over the things that happened in this part of the story as a guideline of things that we can use when we're confronted with our own personal tsunami. So I'm going to read first from the book, and uh, I'm going to read from a chapter called Lazarus. Now we all know the name Lazarus, right? Most of us. Exactly that. And I um, began my work in uh, 1995 in Los Angeles helping uh, people who were dying from AIDS using hypnosis as a palliative pain relieving tool to help them be more comfortable at the end of life, particularly so that they could be more um, alert and present with their family members to say goodbye. And that brought a great deal of grace to uh, some, of, some of these individuals. Well, right at that time, AIDS treatment changed and the new medicines came out. And in fact, for five years, my office in Los Angeles was housed in the only building that was built from the ground up as an AIDS hospice in Los Angeles. But when I was there, it was no longer a hospice. It was a, um, a, an administrative building for uh, some of the services for AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And uh, we were the only clinical services that were in the building. And what I did is I ran my project there and I provided these self-hypnosis workshops. And the reason for that is because in that building is where they tested the, the protease inhibitors and the new treatments. Wow. And it was in that building that people who came there to die left. And in fact, I had the fortune of having somebody come to my workshop to tell me that yes, he had come there in hospice care and had recovered and um, was now living. Well, one of the things that happened as a result of that was a condition known as the Lazarus Effect, where individuals thought that their life was concluding, but then they lived. Yay. And then they didn't know what to do with their life after that. They had only consciously prepared for one thing. For one thing. And, uh, and since then I've experienced that, that with cancer survivors, etc. And so I really wanted to tell this story as the Lazarus story. And, uh, and I'll just begin the reading because I can't set the story up. This, this, this chapter uh, sort of, we all know what happened in India and this story um, sort of sets that up from the beginning. Chapter 17, Lazarus. Kunimudu resembled each of the other villages we had visited. First were small roads, some asphalt and some dirt, lined with small concrete block homes. The roads led to the beachfront where the block homes gave way to thatched huts. The nearer we drew to the beach, the more devastation we saw. 
Eventually, only piles of rubble remained, accented by the multicolored remnants of household belongings. Boats and boat pieces littered the landscape. We strolled along the beach and among the rubble until we came to a concrete pad with worn red paint. In the center of what had been a front porch was a faded white design, a common talisman of greeting painted on the ground at the entrance to homes. The house was only a pile of debris with tree branches and a portion of a wall leaning against a broken and beaten form. I was taking photos of the leaning wall when I noticed a pair of boys' shoes sitting on a built-in shelf the wall was leaning against. As I looked more closely, I realized the shoes were sitting on top of a folded jacket, pants, pack, and a school slate. Next to the stack were a few small toys and a couple of painted bricks set upright with small offerings before them. Here was a shrine to a fallen boy. I reverently paused and offered prayers for the boy's family who had clearly set this shrine here in their suffering of loss. Time stopped for just a few moments. This defamed environment now portrayed the greater destruction of the waves. Saddened, I stepped away from the broken home. Dama was visiting with an elderly gentleman who had been sitting near the beach when we arrived. Vijay and Baskar arrived with the customary mat and chair and placed them on the red concrete slab. I did not want to stir the spirit in this place, but it was clearly the most orderly location for us to do our work. Damo and the man approached me. Damo offered him the seat, and he sat restively in its frame. Damo then began to recount the story he had just been told. <coughs> on the morning of December 26, this 80-year-old man had been sitting on the beach enjoying the rolling surf, which was his favorite pastime. The great wave arrived without warning and gathered him with it. He was able to grab a tree as he was being swept along and held on with all his might as the wave swallowed him and pulled with great force. He held on for as long as he could, but eventually lost his struggle with the wave, let go, and disappeared into unconsciousness. As the villagers searched the devastation later, they found his limp body amid the wreckage and, thinking him dead, took him to the temple where the rest of the dead were being gathered. At some point, someone noticed that he was still faintly breathing. They took him, teetering between life and death, to the hospital. He spent two weeks in a coma, then awakened and began to regain strength. Only a few days previous to our visit, he returned to his village and his favorite spot on the now battered beach. He reported that since awakening, he had been unable to sleep, each night revisiting those horrifying moments as he clung for life. He wanted to be able to regain, along with his life, the joy he had once known on this beach. The team gathered around him. After a grant of permission, we commenced treatment. I placed my hands on his shoulders near the base of his neck as Mita took one of his hands in hers and began to gently massage it. Basker seated at his feet, lifted a foot in his hands, and began massaging also. Damo began his directed breathing and relaxation guidance. The man settled even deeper into the embrace of the chair, his head drifting back to rest upon my chest. I placed my hand over his heart and with Damo's assistance began to guide him back to the fullness of his life. You are here now with us, I said. You have survived. Your life is yours. Now rest. Rest yourself here in our care and let your fears and concerns drift away. Like a handshake or embrace, we entreated one another to meet the other's need, ours to give care and his to receive. We continued the guided relaxation and release with a gentle, rhythmic pace and no thought for time. The layers of release deepened with each exhalation, his and ours. During the treatment, a movement in the corner of my eye 
drew my attention away toward the sea. I had been aware of the rolling surf since we arrived, but this wave seemed a bit taller than the rest. It seemed that it had a greater force as well. I felt a shudder within and a terror that this wave was different. This wave seemed as though it would not stop at the shore, but overwhelmed the sandy beach and crashed directly upon us. Maintaining contact with a man, I turned my attention fully to the wave, responding to the inner alarm to assess our risk. Soon I saw that the wave was shrinking. Though it was a large wave, it was not a great wave. It broke and rolled upon the beach as each wave before and after. In my moments of terror, however, I came to understand the fear our friends were facing. There was an innate concern that as surprising as the last, another wave would come and finish the destruction left undone. Now I began to understand this tsunami terror. It was something inside, something anticipatory that looked for outer signals to confirm it. I exhaled, released my tension through the soles of my feet, and returned my focus to this aged infant in my hands. We let him rest for some time. <coughs> when he stirred, we helped him back to his senses, back to himself. He opened his eyes and gazed about at us with sweet kindness. He reported feeling much better, like he had had a dream that he was home again, like he was back on the beach enjoying the surf. He turned to look out at the waves, took a deep breath, thanked us, and rose up from the chair. Now, as I read through that, any comments, any observations yourself? When I was reading the book, I was amazed at how everybody accepted you and brought you into their yeah. homes and, and cooked for you. It's like you was always eating somewhere, <laughs> Timothy. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> he was. They was always going to somebody's house and eating. <laughs> That's why I say that the, the, the book but should I mean, be subtitled. It seemed like they were so gracious to have you there. And they they so really were. And, and, um, and so much of that is discussed in the book. There's, there, we didn't, I didn't know what to expect at all. Oh, I'm sure. And, uh, sure. Yeah. and I didn't know how they would respond to our, our, our tools, our methods, using hypnosis and Reiki. Um, but they, they were so happy. And, and when we would ask them if we could touch them, they would say, yes, uh, it would be like being touched by a god. Now, that, I carry that theme through in the story to realize, and it is indeed one of the elements of how to survive mm -hmm. uh, our personal tsunami, because we need that touch from a greater force in order to give us a sense of security. And the, most, the thing is that, you know, it's like you said, you're impressed at their hospitality toward us. Well, with what all they were going through. Yeah. You know, I mean, the I first... Mean, they welcomed you and... The first visit that we had was in a shell of a home that had been flooded out by a mm -hmm. tsunami, you know, and the water marks are still on the wall. And, but they, it really is a force of healing, simply caring, and for a person to feel that they are cared for. I really do feel that maybe is the first medicine, mm -hmm. is the feeling that we are cared for, that we matter enough. Right. I mean, that's what these people were saying. What you came here all the way from America for us. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were very moved by that. And I think that, yeah, maybe that is. Uh, I, I wrote a couple of notes down here, and then I realized even as reading through, and I wanted this to be a little bit of a discussion as well to see some things that you picked out and maybe some personal things that you're dealing with that we can address with some, some specifics. But I, I do think that um, the dynamic of that, even though, you know, I'm a clinician um, and even amidst all of the wonderful ambient spirit work that we do in this, this kind of fairs and, and a lot of this healing work, I'm really very much a clinician. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, if it's in the medical literature, if I have citations, if I'm very much about clinical tools. But 
India is a land of mystery and a land of spirit. And it was inevitable that it was that spiritual thing that, as I said, there, and I'll tell some more of the book, is, now, by the way, I do have these books. If you don't have a copy, you should definitely get to take it with you. Yeah, it's but, awesome. But there's a conversation that I have with a fellow who basically tells me that. He says, you know, when we were, when the tsunami came, we were like children lost, and we cried out to God, God, please help us. And he said, but God does not have feet that he can walk out among us, and God does not have hands that he can reach out and touch us. But you have feet, and with your feet, you have come here. And you have hands, and with your hands, you have reached out and touched us. And the people feel as though you were sent by God as an answer to their prayers. Mm -hmm. And so again, that makes them feel like they matter, you know? And when a person feels like they matter, we activate something within them. And I have to be honest about some of this too because like I said, I have confronted my own challenges over time including the challenge, you know, there was a period of time, as you might guess, for years, where it was like, no, I can't get run over by a bus right now, I have to finish my book, um, you know? <laughs> I ain't got time to get in. You know, it, it's like nothing else could happen, it was the most important thing, and it became this gargantuan task. And, um, and the struggle sometimes to realize things like that, you know, one can get lost in hope and despair, and even for me in my work, it's been, it's been a wonderful boon to me, the Chinese use the word boon. Mm -hmm. Boon is like a gift. Yeah. Um, that when I feel like giving up, or whenever I feel like just, you know, changing gears or changing careers or doing something, then I come back to saying, no, I need to keep doing what I'm doing because it matters to people. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in a way, I think that sort of fuels what is an underlying principle of surviving our tsunami? You know, the first note that I made was that this man, when he was captured by the wave, I mean, the first important thing to remember about this man is that he had beauty in his life. He had a place in his life and a practice in his life. Hi there, come on in. There's a seat right over here. You can grab one of those and just pull it over. He had. He had something in his life already that mattered to him, mm -hmm. that blessed him and nurtured him and, and elevated him on a daily basis. And so I think that we all need that. We all need to, to have sort of like a reason of being or to even, you know, there's that old thing, it's important to stop and smell the rosers. Mm -hmm. Well, then sometimes that's the only reason to take a walk. Yeah. Is because we know we can smell roses along the way. And so we need to actually cultivate these things in our life. If we're going to survive difficulty, we really cannot survive difficulty without already having something on hand to do that with. And so that's why even before facing any challenge, it's important for us to cultivate lives that are, as the Navajo call, walking in beauty, to find balance and goodness and richness in our lives so that when we're confronted with a challenge, we have something really to fight for. We have something to really to endure for, for the goodness of our lives. It's very common for people going through, you know, uh, very strong health challenges and very serious illnesses, even terminal conditions. We know, all know well, people will survive beyond a significant date, like a graduation of a child, a wedding, or some other event like that, because there's something connecting them to their, their life and the fullness of their life. And so I think the first thing that we must do if we're going to survive our own tsunami is we have to have those things in our life that matter. And then we have to be able to get hold of that in some way. The first thing this fellow did is when the wave got him, he grabbed onto that tree. Mm -hmm. He found something solid to hold on to. Now, Viktor Frankl was a um, psychologist, psychiatrist, I think he's a psychiatrist, uh, who uh, was also Jewish and was also imprisoned in Nazi concentration mm -hmm. camp. And he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. It mm -hmm. really is maybe my favorite book That's of awesome. all yeah. written books. And, um, and there are layers about that book also that are just, you know, I, 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 because I relate so much to him. If you know that book, 
It's the one thing. He's written this manuscript, and it's the one thing of ultimate value for him. As he's going into these camps and they're losing everything, he's hiding that book and he's trying so hard. It becomes the thing that he must secure. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I'm going to tell you this part of the story because you'll read the book and it's, you know, it's an insight you'll see in the book. It's awesome. He's not successful in that. He, he loses the book. And the interesting thing about it, I know. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> and and he and because he struggles so much. I mean, if you know, I mean, he's, he loses family members, he loses all of his wealth, he loses everything, and he's hiding that book, and he loses it. And you know what? Then he wrote a book about losing that book. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> and that become that that became what we know Victor Frankl for, is that he wrote a book about losing the most important thing to him, which was a book. And so he had that thing that mattered. Mm -hmm. And so he, had, he has one saying in his book, he says, he who has a strong enough why can endure any how. In other words, if you have something to do, you will figure out a way to do it. And if that's strong enough for you to do that thing, you'll find a workaround no matter what happens. If the road is blocked, we'll walk over those vehicles. You know, if it's raining, we'll swim there. You know, whatever it is that we need to do. And I think that that is one of the things that we have to establish in our lives first. And we call it purpose. And there's a lot of talk, Ben, especially since the Purpose Driven book came out and a lot of people talk about purpose in their lives. I've, I had a fellow come to one of my workshops once and he was the only person who showed up that night. And so we just had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and he talked about his long-term enduring depression and how much he had struggled with it. And so I talked about, you know, I had that old pat answer, well, you've got to cultivate joy in your life, you know? Well, a couple of weeks later, he comes back to group, and he says, hey, I've got to tell you that my life has completely turned around since the last time I came here. It's the most amazing thing. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, after we talked, I said, you know, I need to get out of the house and I need to go do something. And down the street from my house at this public park, I noticed that they had an archery range. And so I stopped by and I said, hey, you know, do you have archery classes here? Because I'm really good at archery and I'd love to, you know, help out and mentor young people. And he said, for the past two weeks, Timothy, that's what I've been doing. Wow. I go out and they spend my afternoons teaching these young people how to shoot archery. He says, I feel like my life has meaning now. I feel like I have something to do. I have a reason to be here. And so that is very important. And it's important that tree was not just suddenly stuck there. That tree had to grow there over time. It had to be there in its own way to be the anchor at the time whenever he really needed to hold on to that. And so that's what we must do in our lives is to cultivate our sense of purpose, our sense of personal mission, so that when we come up against it, we're not talking about the daily challenges. Life is full of daily challenges, you know. That's We're talking about those challenges that swamp us, those things that make okay, us want yeah. to give up. And those are the ones where we have to hold on to something. You know, when I used to go out and ride the waves a lot, and, uh, and I gave a whole talk, in fact, at one of the uh, health fairs about lessons I learned on the waves, how to survive stress in a difficult time. And, uh, and, when, and I boogie boarded. So on the boogie board, you're holding onto that board, but you have this little leash for the board on your hand. <laughs> yeah. And I've got to tell you, there are times when that wave dumps you, and there's only one thing you can do is hold your breath, because you don't even know what up is at that time. Mm -hmm. You've been turned around so much, you just got to be able to hold the breath. But having that little leash, yeah. <laughs> just that one little, little thing that I can hold on to, it's like, oh, that's up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> then, then we have something to anchor to, and then to... Uh, find our own stability to, to endure the force. Now, in our story, he did, that wasn't enough, okay? He was taken by the wave, and he, quote-unquote, slipped into oblivion, all right? But something else happened, and that's the second point I want to make. It's really important if we're going to survive, we've got to get lucky. This guy had luck on his side. The fact that he was not only gathered up, 
but that somebody had, I mean, what, I can only imagine the circumstance of somebody observing there's still life in this man because his breathing was mm -hmm. very shallow. And so I say, well, he got lucky. We need luck. We need charms in our life. And we need, that's another thing, that we actually need to cultivate luck. Now, how do we cultivate luck? Well, Tell us. I'm, I'm open, Jim. <laughs> I am open. Here's how we cultivate luck. We're listening. There's a, gr there's a great man, uh, Earl Nightingale, did a whole series of these uh, audio programs. They were radio programs back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, something like that, all entitled Lead the Field. It's a brilliant little 10-minute spots that are just brilliant little theme talks. And in one of these talks, Earl Nightingale says, luck is what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. See, we always talk about, man, that guy was lucky. He just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, he just happened to be there because he happened to be go going there every day. Or he just happened to be there because he saw something going on over there that he thought might be important or valuable to him. So opportunity, you know, we say opportunity knocks. Let me tell you something. Maybe opportunity does knock, and I, I can tell so. you, it does come knocking. But no, more often than not, opportunity answers the door after we've been knocking. And so we need to really, again, develop and cultivate circumstance and opportunity in our own life. We cannot, I mean, look at this fellow again. Talk about the, his luck. He was out there on that beach that day. He was trying to find his way. And what a fortuitous thing it was to him that we just happened to show up right then when he, he was wondering, how am I ever going to be happy on this beach again? Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, here we are, you know, <laughs> our, our band of merry minstrels here to show you how it's done. So again, why was it? He wasn't in his house. He wasn't out, out away. He was at the place that he knew he was trying to do what he could to regain the balance in his life. Now, what's the other thing? Luck is what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. So we also then need to prepare ourselves each day for the things that may happen, that may come along for us. There are certain things, you know, I carry, uh, I actually have a couple of business cards in my wallet now, which I usually don't. Yeah, but no, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I usually don't carry business cards, but I said, no, I'm going to a public event, Timothy. Uh, <laughs> you better put a business card in your wallet. That's preparedness. It That's is. what I'm talking about. Think about what I might need, okay? If you ever read uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he said, you know, don't go anywhere without your towel. So that's one of these continuing themes in this offbeat uh, book about traveling in the cosmos is like always take your towel. Well, these are very good. For what purpose? <laughs> Have you, you take a shower? Well, <laughs> what, <laughs> not be dirty. Like whatever like you it. may need. Yes, <laughs> I mean it seriously. When you're traveling, you take a you take a a, a plush you know foldable uh, face towel because that's functional for a lot it's of like things. Like your mother always told you, wear clean underwear. Yes. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I did end up down, I was down in Costa Rica and I was invited to this fire ceremony and I kind of did, I was just, you know, was off the cuff and I went and then they said, oh, um, they, I don't know if they told me there's going to be a sweat, but I grabbed my towel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did have my towel. Yeah. And, then, and then they said, okay, now for this part of the ceremony, we want everybody to just go lay by the fire and sleep for a couple of hours and then we'll come wake you. Well, other people who had read the, you know, instructions on what they needed for the night, they brought their blanket. <laughs> but, you have a towel. but I had a towel. <laughs> so that's what I say. You know, if you have a big enough towel good, yeah. that, can, that you can cover yourself with, uh, you'll be good. Sleep in bed. All right. The next, the next point I want to uh, to mention on this. Any questions about this? Are there any other comments about this topic about getting lucky? I mean, I can't say enough. <laughs> Don't ask me, Sheila. That you yeah, know, exactly. 
Well, so I would like to say something. Yes. My daughter has always been like since she was little, and we used to marvel at it and we joke about it and, and we tried to figure it out. And as an adult, I finally have figured out it's it's really what you focus on expands. Yes. And she chooses to think of something she really wants, and she puts all this energy and thought in it. And sometimes it takes a long time. Yes. She decided at 40 years old, living in Seattle, having been, never been married, that she wanted a child. So she focused on having a child, and she eventually, two and a half years later, manifested the child. And then she focused on the husband, and now she's manifested a husband. It is just bizarre to me how she's been able to create her life, and that's really what we all do, but we don't realize we do it. It's exactly. I mean, you really do bring that in. Like I said, I, I, I speak so clinically. But, you know, it is a little esoteric, and trust me, in the book, you'll find there are many very, it's India. There's wild things happen in India, and I had some amazing spiritual consciousness experiences that were mind-blowing. But it's intention, you know, and that is that when we have that intention, look, one person gets up in the morning and they say, boy, today's probably going to be a rotten day. I probably... Um, won't be able to find what I want to eat. And, and so, right. so, so <laughs> all day long, looking around, they're, wa they're walking past, they're, they're driving past delicious food because they think they won't find what they're looking for, okay? Whereas the other person says, today's gonna be a marvelous day, I probably am going to enjoy some of the best food I've ever had today. They're gonna stop at uh, Jack in the Box, no, what is it, uh, talk, oh, no, Taco Tico's not around. Uh, 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 Jack in the Box. Jack in the Box is still around. Yeah. They'll, they'll pull into uh, Taco Bell, Oh my goodness, have you ever had that seven layer burrito? I can't believe how fabulous it is. Why is it? And the thing is, it is wonderful when you, uh, when you eat it with wonder. Things gain the wonder, things gain their value and their strength through what they are and through how we receive them. So if we have the expectancy that things will go well, we will look for opportunities. I mean, how often does that happen? I know somebody today is going to walk, just walk in and slam down a $100 bill on my table. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm going to be watching everybody walking past my office all day long. Yeah. Is that the one? Is that the one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and guess what? It's happened before. So, you know, wow. it can happen again. You have to cultivate some of the circumstances around there. All right, the, then the, the last two things I want to say about this is not to part of getting lucky is to receive good care. And one of the things that happens when we're in distress is we tend to isolate ourselves. And we actually tend to reject care. People who come to us that want to help out, we often turn that away. Listen, what I've told people over time is entertain them. They need to help somebody. Let them help you. You'll be doing a service for them. Just think of it that way. But when I went, I went to Geneva to work at the United Nations and we had to go through this whole leadership training program. And one of the things they told us was the most powerful thing that we could do was to ask for help. Because they said, when you ask for help, people become your advocate. And they will, they will try to help you with what your needs are. So one, identify what kind of help or care we need, and then receive it. Sometimes receiving it means taking the action to go get it. Sometimes receiving it means light, relying on our luck and good fortune that we've already cultivated. <laughs> We're already <laughs> lucky people. So, you know, somebody is very likely, it's likely that before this day ends, and my chair out there, somebody will sit in that chair and receive a treatment that's going to change their life. I know it will happen before these two days in because it always happens when I go back. And there are two things there. One, they got lucky that they came to the fair and this thing was there. Two, they got the good fortune of accepting sitting in that chair in this weird thing. People don't know when they sit in that chair what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. They take kind of a, a plunge of faith to say, okay, I trust you. And then they open their eyes and say, oh my. Wow, yeah, I like the wow. What chair yeah. is this? Oh, over at my table. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. this. <laughs> so uh, what I did is, um, just to let you know, is that uh, we went into these villages and we did these clinics where 
we would actually, like, it, what, like what I described there, there would be a team of us. We overwhelmed these people with care. And I really do feel in some ways that we met the destructive force of the tsunami with an equally caring force of yeah. their perception of us. And the way that th there was a very specific element that we used there where we would have one person massaging a hand, maybe one person on each foot massaging the feet. We'd have one person, I would be talking in English with my hands on the shoulders or the breath, the chest here, while another person is speaking in Tamil to them, we overwhelmed them. And when we overwhelmed them, they had to release into the new way. Wow. And it's, it is a hypnotic technique and a hypnotic dynamic that we use. When I came back from India, I said, I want to write all of these techniques onto a single script. And I wrote a script called The Five Minute Miracle. And then when we went to uh, New Orleans after Katrina, I found that people didn't have time to sit in a chair and give us care, you know, receive care. Uh, people came to the they relief. Didn't have time. No, they came to the relief camp in St. Bernard Parish to get meals three times a day and to get supplies to muck out their houses. This is ten months after Katrina, and people are still just grinding through it. And so I said, "Look, I got a folding recliner." I put it in the chow line far enough back so that people wouldn't be stressed that they were going to miss their place in line. And I, and I recorded the recording, the five minute miracle, onto a CD and I would just give this treatment there. It was astounding what happened. And so since then, that's what I've done. I, I mean, amazing, amazing things happen. I had a guy sit in the chair, get a treatment, get out of the chair and he said, wow. He said, yesterday I told my wife I couldn't take it anymore. I was going to put a gun in my head. And he said, now I feel like I can go on. Okay, these are the kinds of transformations. And so that's what I do now is I take this treatment out to public venues because I know people are out there that need help. They don't know where to get it. Here I is. I bring it out there to just make it available. It's a stress relief program, but I call it disaster relief for everyday life. And then the last thing I want to say, and then we're, we're going to be done. And it goes back to the first thing. And that, and that was to find the things that matter in your life to cultivate your purpose, to find beauty, to see the world as a wonderful place that you are a part of. And as you cultivate those things, when a challenge comes to you, you will experience the fullness of yourself. You must be courageous. What is courage? Courage is confidence in ourself to be able to handle a circumstance. Courage is what happens. I don't know, have you seen that video on, that's funny, I'm going to go to a, a, a viral video. That videotape where that little boy is in the driveway and the pit bull comes and pulls him off of the uh, trike and that cat comes off the porch oh, yes. and that's whips the snot out of that dog. Yes, I've seen that. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever it comes time, all claws out, all forward, that you're ready to face the challenge. Because what I've learned is that we can, and there are times for us to be still and rest and not force against the tide. If you ever get caught in a riptide, you know you don't fight it. Mm -hmm. You wait for the moments where you can move. But once that moment happens, you paddle and kick like never before. You bring that thing up from within. And it comes back full circle because where do you get that thing? You get that thing because you've been nurturing it over time and you follow the pathway to get out there to get help, to accept the help that comes along. And then that help does one thing and it's what I do with the hypnosis tools, with the acupuncture and Chinese medicine tools. I tell the students, the needles have no power. My words, their words. What power do they have? They have the power to activate the power within you. And so no matter what, it's ultimately going to come back to nurturing and strengthening your ability to withstand. Not just to be the guy, but to be the tree that mm. still stands a storm. All right, any questions, comments, or concerns? Awesome. All right, we're right up at 3 o'clock. Anything else? So is that what you do, the five-minute miracle? Yeah, I, I have the chair over here. Okay. So we'll go we'll all go over there and experience the five minute miracle and I'll close with a little song.
isn't there? That is beautiful. Mm. What, what nationality? Yeah, this is a uh, it's Native American medicine flute. Um, it is a Navajo flute. It's made by a, a maker um, over in Arizona named Jonas Thompson. And, um, and what I love about his flutes, I've got uh, three of his flutes, is he makes the most remarkable fetishes on these flutes. This one is an eagle. You can see wow. the eagle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I play this flute. This is the flute that I played during, I bought it just before I came back here. Um, we were in Los Angeles. We were on our way back the day that the Moore tornado happened. So, 48, out, which 48 one? hours later, the, yeah, which one? <laughs> which one? <laughs> the last We've one. So many. Um, yeah, not the last one, the one before the last one. Um, yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and I was at Moore Baptist Church playing this flute, you know, 48 hours oh, after the. Can you tell us about India just uh, briefly, what you did that you experienced this wonderful thing? Uh, well, I went there to work in tsunami recovery after the Asian, Great Asian Tsunami in 2004. And uh, we went to several fishing villages uh, along the coast and did interventions for uh, a variety of different conditions. You know, and, I, and that was one of the things that I did in the book. I, you know, one, a couple of things that in the book, I, I wanted to tell the story. Each case that I reported was a different kind of case and different kind of circumstance that we might our, ourselves be dealing with mm -hmm. or know people that are dealing with. So to tell people who wanted to do this kind of work, how it could be done. I tell the whole story of building my organization and so forth. So I do, ha I do have each, you know, a lot of different cases and a lot of different stories in here. And we eat a lot of great food in India. <laughs> but you said you oh, had God. a lot of really unusual experiences and I thought, well, is that because miracles were happening for these people who had been through that tragedy? I, I, I think one, yes, that's true. And for all of them, that's true. But, um, but uh, a lot of those mystical experiences were happening to me. And they were happening to me because I, wanted, I was on a grand mysterious excursion. And I was in the place of mystery to, to experience that. And yes, I tell these, lots of these stories in the book. Thank you.